Um, lovely to see you all back here. We've got a session today about how do we start thinking about transitions. I run something called the School of Systems Change, where we're trying to really understand how do we learn to lead in this complex world. And we've heard this morning already about the uncertainty, the injustices, the environmental collapses, all those big issues. We're not going to go into them here today. What this session was about was trying to offer different framings, different ways of thinking about transition, about the change we might need to take. At the school, we take a multi-method approach. We believe that there's not one, you know, it's not a competition between us about which one's the best framework, but that some frameworks are useful to help us move from that state of overwhelm to a state of agency, for a state of, can I do something about this? How do I be in this world? So we, we're going to look at some of these frameworks. Uh, we're going to start with Johan to talk about, he's come from a historical background, uh, talking about deep transitions. Um, so I'm just going to, because we're a bit behind. Um, so Johan, would you like to go? Thank you. Um, over the last uh, two years, I've been working with a panel of investors, 16 investors, public investors, private investors, institutional investors, impact investors, also philanthropist, to rethink investing based on transition theory. Uh, we developed a new philosophy you can find on the internet, but I, there's kind of three principles to this. One is that uh, investment perhaps should not focus immediately on the impact, let's say lifting people out of poverty, uh, because if you do that, you can still, you know, have syst what we call system optimization. And I will come to that notion. Uh, so you need to focus investment on system change. And then you have to realize that system change or transition are very complex processes. So you can only make a contribution. But the question is, how can you specify that contribution? And... Another lesson or another important principle is the need for collective action. Because some of these investors, they look at impact, for example, for individual companies or activities or projects, for example, in healthcare, and they make 10 investments, but they never look at the portfolio. They never look at how all these investments together enable change, and certainly not across investors. Uh, because the, the principle is that we need more collective action in the sector for enabling system change. So what is system change or transition? So when I say transition, I think uh, about three things. One is about actors. I talk here in, on the slide about regime actors. So actors need to change. The second one is the phenotype of the, the system. So this is about policy, culture, user preferences, science and technology. All of these elements together, for example, form the energy system. So if you think about the energy system, you need to have all these elements in place and they need to be aligned. So it's not sufficient just to change the technology. It's not sufficient just to change the policy. You need to change all these elements. And as a third component, that's what we call rules. Because in this framework, actors are not driven by calculation per se or by incentives. They are driven by routines or rules. And these are largely unconscious and they are embedded in the phenotype, in the system. So it's very difficult to have a transition by just educating individuals. Because it's a collective process. You need to change the deeper rule set. And this rule set is embedded in values and beliefs. So in the end, it's about the change of value and beliefs. Next slide. So how does change happen? Well, in this, this is a slide about single system change. So it, it basically, it makes a distinction between three levels. So there is a dominant practice, a regime, that needs to open up. Historically, change never happened without some dominant actors opening up for change. So this is a necessary condition. Secondly, we need to build alternative practices. We call that niches. And for these niches, we have a whole set of indicators and how to develop them. And then there is the landscape. The landscape is the urban infrastructure, the a set of trends, but also shocks. So it's the kind of backbone context. And this context influences the relationship between niche and regime. So transitions happen when niches are built and strong, regimes open up, and landscape 
force this dynamic to go in a more sustainable direction. Next slide. So this is why system change is important, a slide uh, that shows that if you want to accomplish uh, impact, get impact, system optimization is not sufficient. It brings you to a certain level, but not far enough. What you can see here is that impact, but also return on investment, which is important for these investors, of course, will take longer, basically. So you need to invest while not knowing about the impact for many years. And this is a problem. Next slide. So this is the deep transition perspective. So why do we call it deep? Well, we call it deep because it's about changing the underlying rules. You could say the genotype. And there are rules shared across systems. For example, circular production, circular economy could become a rule shared across. Now it's linear production, mass production, mass consumption, the use of fossil fuels. So there are a number of rules, we call them meta rules, shared across, and you need to change them. Uh, and secondly, it's about these multiple systems, and they have, built, have been built up over time. There's a long history now, which you may call modernization or industrial revolutions, and it came in waves. And a lot of the current investments reinforce the industrial revolution of the current modernization process, basically. But we need to move to a, what we call here a second deep transition, a much deeper change of all these systems, which will be a redirecting of the economy. And philanthropy and investment needs to contribute to this larger shift of the entire development paradigm. And the question is how to do this. Well, we are setting up, we have a group of investors setting up a deep transition lab, next slide, where we will do experiments, investment experiments. I'm an academic, we used to study things. So what we will do here, we will work together with investors in an investment process, we will bring our inputs and we will have a kind of co-creation process in, in how to do this investment, building theories of change and so on. Uh, so we need action and, and cannot wait till the study is completed. Brilliant and perfect timing there. So thank you. We're giving you a little taster, okay? So usually we could probably just spend a whole day learning about each model and framework, but this is just a taste, a sense. And actually, I find it's really good to... To, to jump our minds, to almost build the muscle, to think in different ways. Because actually, all of these frameworks are just one lens in. So we're going to move to Ada now, and she's going to talk about uh, kind of how she's brought together different, uh, different wisdoms, uh, the digital, the indigenous, uh, the futurist, and, and what does this start telling you about how we might think about transitions and, and, and see what different perspectives you can bring. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's really interesting, the title of Futurist, because I, it, people tend to think you've got some kind of crystal ball. I don't. What I do is I recognize patterns in different worlds. And I've had many a job in technology and innovation and creativity. And I think I'll start with a quote, that, well, a question, actually, because I've got to this beautiful age where I now realize this is the question that I was trying to be, I've been looking for for my entire life. And the question is, what type of ancestor do you want to be? Because what I do is I look around at different patterns and recognition and recognize these ideas. But what I did is I spent the last 10 years mind mapping these patterns that I didn't really have a language to explain. So the world of technology. And for me, I think it's important to frame, technology for me does three things. It helps us to understand and connect with ourselves helps us to understand and connect with each other, helps us to understand and connect with our environment. So that means that we have digital technologies. It means that I also see nature as a form of technology. I see shamanism as a form of technology. I see quantum mechanics as a form of technology. And so what I did was start to um, look at these patterns and these ideas. And I started by asking myself, what's the A word? that appears in all of these things? Anthropomorphism. What's the B? Balance. Curiosity. Diversity. Experimentation. And what that led is to an alphabet. And I then started to look at what, again, because this is the way that my brain works, what are the patterns that I'm seeing to connect these things? 
And I ended up with this framework, recognising. I don't say that I developed it, I recognised it. Because I kept my eyes open and my, as somebody mentioned earlier, this idea of being somatic, I really felt into what I was seeing. And realised that the patterns were the characteristics of ether, air, fire, water, earth. Leave, breathe, grow, flow and ground. And what that means is, as we've heard this morning, leave. We have spent millions, billions trying to redefine problems. And it depends where you sit on how you define that problem, because many problems are defined from the top down. I know that that's a problem, I'm going to define it, and then I'm going to do research amongst indigenous peoples and people of the global majority as research subjects to try and find out what the answer is. Leave. Leave the, problem, leave the old ways behind. Let's stop trying to redefine the problem and let's recreate some new values. What are the values that we need together in this flatter structure of bringing the people who have lived experience around the table to define those values? The second, and that's the, that, when I've worked with Indigenous people, they recognise that as ether, this negative space. The second is breathe. Many of our systems and structures are built on this tension. This, we're holding our breath. If we go right back to the beginning, many of our systems and structures, especially the governing ones, go back to René Descartes, who said that we must be the masters and possessors of nature. And everything that we have done since then has been about extraction and taking. And, but what we do is, the first is leave these new values, breathe, what is the hypothesis, the theory of change that is going to enable all of us to go, to exhale? The next is grow. What are the tools, technologies, rituals, behaviours that we need to change things? We can't keep ch trying to change things if we only talk to ourselves. When I speak at finance conferences, I said, you have to bring in people who have a different lived experience, a different perspective, because we will only get more of the same. Two weeks ago, I was at a conference with investors and technologists and entrepreneurs, and they spent most of the time speaking about the ethics of AI. We need to do something about the ethics of AI. And I turned to them and said, look, we've all got egos, but you are also the people who are investing in these models, and you know full well they are broken. Nothing is going to change if we don't change our behaviours. So that's grow. We have to step outside of our bubbles. We, it may be uncomfortable, but this is what's needed. The next is flow. And the question I ask here is, what type of ancestor do you want to be? Because we still think that in short term. Many indigenous cultures think in seven generations. The things that we're doing, that we are putting out into the world, we shouldn't have to think that it's going to be in our generation. It's about what are we doing. So that's why I love this quote. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And the final one is ground, is ground. And this is about kinship. Kinship, technology, everything that we're doing are relational ecologies. It's about how we are in relation with each other. How do we take this and turn this into a movement? And I've presented this as a linear, but it's not linear. It's the only way I know to explain it right now. Oh, however, actually I just remembered, there is something that I am doing differently. It's, I'm actually working with Friends of the Earth. Uh, they've taken me on as an artist, and I'm, working to, I'm looking to create a somatic experience, a sound experience, that bypasses spoken language to help us really get into that somatic, that trauma, to feel what it is. So the framework is leave, breathe, grow, flow, ground. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. And it's an alphabet. So if you look at my website, message me, I'm happy to share it with anybody who's interested. Thank you. As you can see, very different types of frameworks, different ways in, different mental models to help us to understand how we look at transitions. I'm going to introduce uh, a one um, now about complex adaptive systems. And also it does draw, again, from living systems. Um, and really speaks to some things that people were talking about this morning around how we often uh, don't know which state we're in, which place we are in the cycle of change. 
And for me, um, we often are trying to get to conservation, to storing the energy, to accumulating patterns, uh, the idea of scale, like we need to scale and to grow and to conserve. And this is a good place to be in some places, in, in, in bountiful forests. But in order for energy to keep cycling, in order for life to live, we also need release. So we need to ensure that energy is released. And autumn in this country is obviously a, a time, a natural time, that that release happens. I think it is different from the concept of collapse uh, we were talking about and how harmful that can be. This is about how do we allow the natural cycle of things into a release phase and what happens there. Because only then can we go into reorganisation and renewal. Without that, we, all, we almost, in organisations, start to add on layers. You know, we do a strategy process and then we add on an additional layer to the old strategy rather than release what was and create a new reorganisation, a renewal of what, what you're doing. And then we can start talking about the concept of growth, the new seeds, the new, the building of the new, and how does that work. So there's also something in living systems, which I'm very passionate about, that, that can give a different kind of framework of kind of how do we move through this. So that's, that's sort of three different frameworks. I'm now going to turn to Joy, um, who's going to give us the fourth, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation about what patterns we start to see and how do these frameworks help us think about transition. Again, these are little amused bushes to get your, to whet your appetite today. We could spend a whole week teaching and going through all of these, but hopefully we just get a bit of a flavour of what's going on. Great, so I'm going to be talking to you now. Um, well... <laughs> I will first start with these three questions. So I've been doing system change work with organisations for about 16 years. And these three questions have really started to... Uh, these, these are the three core questions for me. So what is your actual intention? Now, everyone thinks they know what their intention is. Um, but quickly, very quickly in system change work, you discover that the actual intention and the state intention are very different because we all have hidden assumptions, hidden expectations... Uh, hidden, hidden intentions, basically, uh, and quite often they're collectively held. They're collectively, collectively held deep-seated ideas, like endless growth is essential, and they often have a much bigger effect. They're more active. Uh, they tend to be the actual intention and the stated intention. Then, how, what are you paying attention to and how are you paying attention? These are two questions that go very deep. I won't be able to, to do just to it here, but I'll make a start, and I'm going to talk it through with this framework uh, called the iceberg. So probably a lot of you might be familiar with the iceberg. It's a really nice classic framework. It comes from Danella Meadows originally, her sort of liberty points for change. Uh, and it helps you really think through the different levels of a system. And also you get, you know, the deeper you go, so you start off at the apparent surface where everyone can see what's going on, the events, down to the underlying patterns, the flows, the structures, the mental models. And the deeper you go, the more leverage you have for change, but also the much harder it is to bring about change because they're, they're hidden. Now, it's really important to notice the difference between the levels because um, almost everyone focuses their change work on, on that middle level of the iceberg, the trends, the flows, the structures, uh, because they tend to be quantified. Uh, you can express them as numbers. We love that as a society. Uh, and it feels really natural. And these things do need to shift. So it's important to do that. Um, but the deeper levels are actually where the transformation can occur. They are the more qualitative ones around assumptions, values, worldviews. And when they shift, that's when really deep change becomes possible. If they don't shift, it's not possible. And the pandemic is that the best example of this. Because all those flows, all those patterns were shut down, none of the assumptions changed, and we've gone straight back. There was a rebound. And so that is your absolute proof, basically. Um, so, so it's really, really important that you actually get into that transformative space when you're trying to bring out a transition. Uh, and it's important how you do this. Um, because again, yeah, you need to dig out these assumptions, values, and worldviews because you need to really get clear on what is your intention. Uh, you have to dig out those unexamined assumptions and expectations. Um, if you, because if you don't dig them out, you're going to end up very ground, <laughs> ungrounded. Now, how do you ground your your attempt, your intention? That involves how you pay attention. What are you bringing your attention to? So the iceberg floats in an experiential ocean. 
so this is something I've definitely come to, is that like we think the mental models are the lowest level. There's a whole ocean. <laughs> and that ocean is us. So we're really used to thinking of like, it's a system out there. I must go out there and change it. No, we, we are the system. We are the life force. It is us. It is fractal. All those patterns, all those dysfunctions, they're in us. In us, in our relationships, everywhere. They're expressed everywhere. But we are disconnected because we see them, we, we see them as separate from us. So our, literally, since they're shouting at us in our own bodies, in our relationships, these patterns are there. And if you can access them, you get tremendous insight on how to shift the system because it's a whole, it's a fractal thing. And so, and the way in is through the experiential, so through things like, you know, the, the, the somatic quite often, because often um, it's, you, you don't give it attention through the sort of, the, you know, the kind of the, the calculating mind that we've all been trained in. It's, it's through a different route. Um, and it's really important that you pay attention to experiential because it remains there whether you give it attention or not. But if it, if it is allowed to stagnate, it becomes stuck. Uh, you end up with this very heavy transition work. People get burnout, they get ap apathetic. Um, people who are not involved in change work can start to feel, you know, get this sort of panicked, panicked sense of like, uh, which I think we're all familiar with, uh, uh, panic disconnection and even conspiracy thinking. It's like, it's like we're, you know, we're trying to process the experiential, uh, but we don't have the tools to do it. Um, so how do we attend to it? How do we integrate it? And this is what my work currently focuses a bit around. Um, and it's, again, how do you pay attention? So the Western world, the modern world, is really stuck in one very narrow linear mode of attention paying. We've been trained into it from childhood. It's very powerful. It has a lot going for it. So I'm not saying we throw it out, but, it, but it's, we need to expand. <laughs> We need to take in other ways of paying attention. Um, it's, it's a lot more than just bringing in a systemic framework because like we have to train our minds you know, to get to this point, we have to train these other ways of knowing, other ways of experiencing into, into ourselves as well to access them. Um, this is something that goes very deep uh, and it's around the intuitive, the holistic, the experiential, the embodied. And actually the way into it is often through things like wisdom traditions, intuitive herbalism, some versions of mindfulness. Uh, there's a lot of different things, but they all involve a very different way of paying attention. And this person, Ian McGilchrist, I've referenced, so he's very interesting. He's a neuroscience researcher who's done a huge amount on these different modes and how attention actually constructs our world, how you pay attention in these different ways. So if you're interested and you want to learn more about the kind of like all the evidence behind it, that's a really good book to start with. Um, but again, I wanted to just say so, so it's it's about a rebalancing how do you keep the analytical mode but but don't have it as the leader how do you bring the heart in basically how do you bring the heart in because we need the values of the heart we need courage we need generosity we need love we need compassion these are all missing they're missing from our systems we go to work we put them aside and we end up with the calculating values which are all based basically around fear and quite often greed so how do we bring in these values, this is the really, yeah, this is what we're trying to do. Um, so uh, back to using the iceberg. Um, so if you do start to use the experiential, which I do recommend, um, uh, and quite often you might have to use, you know, someone to help guide you quite often. There's lots of different people who use somatic methods or you know, herbalist methods or, or whatever. Um, but it's good to have a framework to guide you into what, you know, what you're doing. Uh, and generally, it's good to start in the experiential first. We want to go really deep into that quality space, ground really deeply there. This is around really sort of under, get, you can get also really clear on those hidden assumptions, on those values, on those fears, on those dreams. And, and there's a lot of key insights. So much insight comes out of there that then helps you with actually all the other levels of the iceberg. Uh, it can really help you unblock stuck patterns. So once you've got into that space and grounded there, then you can start to move back into the more normal cognitive, analytic, strategic space, and you build up from that. But you're building up from a, from a, from a much more grounded place. And it, frankly, it, it, having seen, I started to work more and more in this way, and the difference is profound, actually, when you do change work from this place. Um, 
but yeah, so, and, and you can then combine it with things like the Three Horizons model for those of you who are familiar with it. So what Joy's starting to do there is to do the intricative piece. Um, what patterns? No, it's great. No, no, that's perfect. That's what we're going to sort of spend the last 15 minutes talking about is I also love pattern spotting, uh, love looking at history and living systems and technology and indigenous wisdoms um, and trying to, how do we bring all these things together? And I did a bit of work that was trying to understand what are, what are some of the patterns across these frameworks uh, that help us understand transitions, uh, help us to start working with them. So just, I think, throwing it back out to you three, what are you seeing? Like, what's interesting from listening to the, to the others in terms of the other three frameworks, in terms of how do we start understanding transitions? What are the different pieces? I see, I see the waves, I see the cyclical nature, I see the depth and, and what requires there. I see even the emergence of saying, you know, you creating a, a framework. What, what is emerging for me? Where is it? What's my personal framework as well? Like, that's a great question as well. But I don't know, any reflections or observations about things that you're seeing that are similar or different? I think some, one of the... Well, many things I've seen similar, but one that I think we should talk about is this concept of deep time. There is a, in each one of our... Because you're a historian, and that you talked about the iceberg and a lot of your framework. For me, there's always... I think sometimes when there are frameworks out there, they don't bring in the concept of deep time, and we have to think about the fact that change takes time. We can't shortcut things. We've been developing te emerging technologies at a rapid pace. And that meant that we bypassed many of the things, many of the questions that we should have been asking. And I think with the frameworks that we're, we're talking about, it is about taking that pause and recognizing that the work we're going to do now, the work that we are doing now, will change, but not, probably not in our lifetime. And that's okay. It isn't that we have to see something right now. I would like to indeed uh, confirm that this, I, I like this notion of deep time because history doesn't come in one piece. Uh, so if you in this deep transition framework we see history first of all as layered. So we build layers on layers. So the landscape is a set of layers and every new development adds layers to this, this landscape. Uh, so we live in a, and that's very important to recognize, in a very layered uh, environment. And uh, the other thing is that history is often written as the history of the winners, but the so-called losers often keep their space. So there is a whole history of alternative spaces that is with us. While, you know, we live the dominant practice, there are these, and so we need to also connect. And this is for me the word of the niches is partly about alternative spaces, you know, and there are many of them that need to be, become more visible. And the work of the history work we do is partly to make this more visible. I want to make another observation is because I'm, I'm an academic, a researcher. We often, you know, want to be objective. And the change does not include us. Because in the kind of work we are doing now, uh, we focus on second order learning, which includes also the researchers. So in these experiments, where we work with, you know, together with investors, we also try to reflect on our own learning. And we document that. So we try to generate cycles of learning and ask the question whether our deeper assumptions are challenged and in what way they are challenged. And then you get to emotions and, and, and some of the things you are, you know, addressing and, and, and provided language for to think about. Uh, so this should be part of this experimentation, this kind of, because in the end, transition is about values, beliefs, emotions, the way we are embedded in the world. There's something in there about the inner arc of change and the outer arc of change, another framing of that that's really important. We kind of get obsessed with the urgency and the changing out there, but actually these, the, think how long it takes for you to change. I know for me personally, to change, just a micro ex example of that, I've been swimming for many, many years and I used to swim only breathing on the right and it's taken me five years to learn how to breathe on the left. <laughs> and, but I joke, but it's that, if that's how it's just a change of physical movement, what does it mean to t change a deep emotional pattern of mine uh, it, 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 it takes time, and how do we acknowledge that? 
there anything else that you're noticing, Joy? Well, yeah, so interesting is the concept of time. And so one thing that has come through quite strongly in the experiential work I've been doing recently has been this, almost this sort of, um, cause, because we, I think because we live in such a sort of accelerating kind of squashed, you know, time, just like you know, <laughs> on a daily basis. And, and what's come through really strongly is this sort of desire for like, space, spaciousness, spaciousness and expansive, almost like timelessness, actually. And, and there's something, again, around the experiential can offer you, you know, if you, if you do develop your own kind of experiential practice, it can offer you these kind of, almost like portals into the kind of like, there's kind of non-linear, like, timelessness uh, that you can also bring into your work. So it's, it's very, something interesting around the, the non-linear. So when we talk about it in you know, the tech world, they're like, non-linear, exponential growth, blah, blah, blah. But there's a different aspect to the non-linear, which is almost like the access to a, a very helpful spaciousness uh, that doesn't judge, that is very creative, that actually allows what is present to tell you what needs to happen. Um, and there's something very uh, incredibly helpful about that, <laughs> but also very needed. But I think it speaks to this, this so, uh, yeah, this question of time is really interesting in that um, it's, it's really good to slow down, to remember, yes, it's not actually, it's not all on us. We just have your, you have your own microcosm to deal with. That's plenty. <laughs> deal with that. <laughs> but if, if, you, if you do give it proper attention, it will also, it will, it will influence those around you. So there's kind of something really interesting around if you hold attention in this more spacious way. And I really recommend uh, visiting Ian McGregor <laughs> to discover what, to, what, what. But also those who meditate might know a bit more what we're talking about as well. So it's this access to a different mode of attention then gives this space, gives this almost, this almost like expansive time and this reassurance yeah that like we're, we're part of a part of the part of the life on the planet that, that's trying to reorganize itself uh and you know we can we can play our bit yeah. And I, yeah go i just wanted to share a quote that actually i think for me some some of what we were just talking about it's by octavia e butler it's in one of her books and it says all that you touch you change all that you change changes you the only lasting truth is change. And for me, that really sums up a lot of what we've just spoken about here. Yeah, yeah. and I was actually going to talk about, you know, we, you know, what we put into the system becomes a system. And your point there about the niches, or you also talked about how do we move from impact to contribution and understanding what's good enough contribution as well. What are the different, you talked about fractals. What are the fractals that we're putting into the system? How do we, we not think that the work we have to do is huge and massive. And, and I think at the very beginning, somebody talked about debunking the idea of scale and big but actually there's something in the smallness but how do we use these framings and these ways to understand how does our smallness have that ripple or that long long term effect or that deep time uh, effect as well so there's something in that concept that I think has come out from, from some of us is there any differences or anything that, sort of that, that, that you're noticing I'm noticing the tension between like concrete structural frameworks and then this softer side and the, the, the dancing between those two things but I don't know if, if there's anything that also is popping up for you I think that tension is uh, very productive we should just leave it because I think we need both. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think uh, that's, I want to come back to the issue of uh, acceleration because on the one hand, we live in a time where it's very clear we need a deep change. It becomes clearer and clearer to many people. And uh, we, should, we are aware and we should be aware, I think that you know, the world is a green place in fact. So, and it will become more difficult. If you look at this picture of let's, what I call the first deep transition, that took 250 years. Okay, so some people are asking me, okay, do we need another 250 years for this second deep transition? And of course, that is a pertinent question. I don't have a clear answer to that. Oh, I thought you were going to give it to us. <laughs> to be honest. And I don't, but I, I agree with Ada here that you know, to force change 
to come about to accelerate for, is, is not the way because it's a learning process. It's a deeper process. It involves emotion and it involves these changing these systems, involves changing all of these dimensions. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the answers to can we accelerate is coordination. So, because in the end, it's about agency, yes, but people become coordinated. And, and so that's, so that's something we can work on, is to become more connected. Uh, that's the only answer I can give, but uh, we will just have to live it, I guess. There's something about the relational as well. I don't know if anyone wants to talk to that, because I think what we don't often see in these framings is we talked about the inner stuff and the outer, but the relationship between those two, how do we relate to people? How, do these frameworks, do these ways of thinking help us have conversations together, help us work together? Um, and I don't know if anyone wants to speak to the relational elements of this, these frameworks. Well, I think the way that uh, my, the framework that I shared comes together is through conversation. So the deliberate provocation. So the framework itself is a provocation. The name, the title is a provocation. It's called cyborg shamanism. And instantly people are like, ah, what is that? <laughs> but if you take the way that I've just described technology as connect, helping us to understand self, other, and our environment, then digital technology does that. Cyborgs is using a form of technology to augment the biological. Shamanism is using a form of technology, plant medicine, spirituality, sound, to augment the, the, the biological. So in some aspects, cyborgs are digital shaman, and shaman are ecological, organic cyborgs. And the, the, a lot of the framework that I've put, I put together or I share is about bringing those things that are seemingly opposites together to have a conversation, because there is space for both. There is space for chaos. We need to, I think we need to be comfortable with the fact that chaos is a part of our life. We can't put everything into neat boxes. We try to do that, and I think that's why we've messed up where we are now. Because we are trying to say that this needs to be this. It's, it's like job titles. What do they really mean? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I think I'm slightly obsessed with the idea that we have these flipping job titles. But this, the, there is... The tension is good because it makes us uncomfortable and it's important that we do that. How I recognise what I'm doing now is by suddenly having this moment of clarity. And I went, it feels like what we're doing is we're looking for a new religion through technology. And so I wrote an article, a piece called Escaping Plato's Cave. Because it is about understanding that whilst there are many different frameworks and different ways of being that may seem different, it's how we have the conversation and make space for the respect and the value and the understanding that there are different ways of seeing, different ways of being, different narratives that are a part of the whole. Great, thank you. And we've got a couple of minutes left, so it'd be great to hear just one thing from each of you in terms of what would you give the audience when they're trying to move from this overwhelm of the complexity, the challenges, and, and, and what has kind of... Frame, I guess we're, we're kind of framework geeks here, but what, what would you give to the audience in terms of what, what has helped you or what, is, what has stayed with you with working with these frameworks? Joy, do you want to go? <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I would say I, like, the iceberg is definitely my go-to framework, but there's something around... Well, my, my, my advice would be get yourself an experiential practice it's the most helpful thing you can probably do. <laughs> but it's one that you, can, you have an affinity with. Um, and there's a lot out there. But there's something around, yeah, l l how do we expand how we pay attention? To me, that is, that is the transition. If we manage that, everything else will happen. So there's the framework, and then there's actually the way we practice and the attention we bring to it. Well, my, <clears throat> I think we need to build alternative practices but we need to do that in what I call a double movement. So the first movement is to build it and to do that as good as possible. So build these niches. The second movement is reflection, experience, you know. So, so make sure it's what you may call a learning process and a deeper learning process where tensions will be there, 
but we challenge our underlying assumptions and make sure uh, they are included. And I don't think we have to come to agreement. So in, in a way you could say my motto would be divided we stand. <laughs> um, so constantly ask yourself the question, what type of ancestor do you want to be? But where I've got to on a very personal journey, and I think it's what I do when I ask big corporates, is what would success look like if it wasn't dependent on looking at humans or nature as capital? If we t remove that idea and on a personal level, thinking about how I change my life now, by looking at things, my measure of success cannot depend on measuring human or nature capital. What possibilities are there for me? It really shifts my thinking. And it's quite difficult, but it's not impossible. Brilliant, thank you. And all of these are music to my ears, because my, my motto is about, and the School of Systems Change is about learning is change. And how do we continually lean? So thank you so much for the three of you for joining me, and for you for spending uh, 45 minutes with us. Thank you. Thank you.